It doesn't get you over your insecurities. It doesn't get you through arguments. It doesn't get you through disagreements and problems and hurdles. Like you can't just love your way out of it. Today, we are going to be talking about relationships. And I want to start with the idea of why love isn't enough. I think you and I would agree that love actually isn't enough if you want to have a thriving relationship. And love, as controversial as this may be, is not how we've gotten to 19 years. It's controversial. I think some people will. It's a very romantic notion to think that you get as far into a relationship as we've gotten. And I'll say there's a really amazing phrase that is so true about love. Necessary, but not sufficient. Hmm. You have to have it. Like that's a prerequisite. If you don't have it, you're really gonna be in trouble. But that isn't the thing that's allowed us to navigate through and get here. So, but before you say how we've gotten here, why isn't love enough? I think when me and you got together, we, I mean, we both have divorced parents. And so for you, marriage wasn't really a must either. In, in a way, it was more like a, sure. I didn't I mean, plan to get married, to be honest. Yeah, so it's like if you meet the right person. Um, and then for me, I was so worried about why do 50% of marriages fail? Like, if everybody thinks they're in love, but then ends up 50% divorce, there's a massive chasm between the time you fall in love to, you know, when people get divorced and what happens in between that chasm. And I think for me and you, we just discussed that. It doesn't get you over your insecurities. It doesn't get you through arguments. It doesn't get you through disagreements and problems and hurdles. Like, you can't just love your way out of it. Why not? Why can't you just love your way out yeah, of it? Yeah, like, as prepping for this episode, I was really thinking that I think a lot of people can give you ideas about what to do to overcome the gap. But I don't know that a lot of people can explain what the gap is. Ooh, I so, want you to explain. I think you're going to have a question. Well, it's interesting here. because you touched on a lot of what I think that it is, but it, it ultimately comes down to change, I think, is the single biggest thing that is, the chasm is made up of, Ooh. that just over time, like I'll even really make it sort of a basic thing and say that your hormones change throughout the course of a marriage. And when you sort of peg, so the seven year itch, right, is where you've got the guy who's got this uh, massive sex drive, testosterone, compelling him to seek novelty. And so you get this like breakdown of, especially if it's sort of an OG relationship where by the time you are seven years in, you've already had kids and they're probably at about two or three years old, which they say is about the length to which nature has ensured that the guy stays engaged. And it makes sense mm -hmm. that you need the woman to finish the pregnancy to get the kids sort of to a balanced, you know, stable state. It's not like they could go off and take care of themselves, but that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so if you were gonna say what's the thing that the chasm is made up of, it's change. Can I actually ask you a question? Is I this... love how quickly you have flipped the table here. <laughs> I, I have. But here's the thing actually, because as you were talking though, isn't it like your cells and your skin regenerate? Seven years. Seven years. I literally was about to say, isn't it seven years? I doubt they have anything to do with each other, but that's so interesting. But if you're fundamentally, your body isn't the same cells and whatever, wherever else it is, if it's right. not the same in seven years, then wouldn't that be a part of it? I, I think that you're grouping things that they have a spiritual core of something that feels like they must be related. But to me, honestly, the thing there that's far more interesting is how every seven years, if you're turning over every single cell mm. in your body, how is it that you have a permanent sense of self mm. that does change but feels entirely connected? So for me, that's less, I think, enlightening in terms of what happens in a marriage. But you have that people change, that they have different rates of change, that they are learning different lessons in life. Mm. One may be going into like a turtling up mode. Life has sort of kicked them around and not been what they expected. Maybe the other person feels more expansive over time and things have gone well. And so they begin to understand each other less and less. And that brings me to what I think is sort of the second thing, which is I'll put a really uh, overly fine point on it, but I think that it's it hints at the deeper, more profound issue which is they're not using the same words and they think they are. Hmm. That hints at what's actually the bigger problem, which is misunderstanding each other at such a profound level that you don't realize you're misunderstanding each other. 
So you think you are having the same conversation. And it's funny, I was just talking about this today on Impact Theory University, where I was like, here's the problem with emotions. They make things seem self-evidently correct. <laughs> so I am angry. Therefore, it is self-evidently correct that you have done something wrong. And the fact that it feels self-evidently correct, you don't think to question, like, why are, why are you arguing for your position? You know it's wrong. And that's where people get. The other person doesn't think they're wrong. The other person thinks you're just as crazy as you think they are. Mm. But no one ever stops to get to that. So do you think that the definition then of how people see love changes? Whoa. I did not even think about that. I think that it does almost certainly change. But the bigger problem was that they never agreed what it meant in the first place. Oh. Uh -huh.